Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Scotty Lee Edler and I look forward to speaking to the Graduate Student Association Forum today here at Midwestern State University and presenting my research on the Hohenzollern and Hanoverian dynasty relationships and it is focused on Wilhelm II, Frederick III, and Victoria dysfunctional family relationship. First, I'd like to discuss the maternal grandparents from the House of Hanover. Queen Victoria, who will live from 1819 to 1901, and her, her prince consort, Prince Albert of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha, who lives from 1819 to 1861. Queen Victoria had been on the throne since 1837. And by 1858, you begin to see monumental political changes throughout Europe. Victoria and her husband were both considered to be liberals. Her husband was a German by birth, but very pro-English, British. And they looked to spread their idea of constitutional government, constitutional monarchy, throughout Europe. They hoped to do this for two reasons. First, to bring political change throughout Western and eventually Eastern Europe, seeing more liberal democracies spring up out of the conservative constitutional monarchies, and also to create new alliances for the British Empire. While looking around for a partner in this, they see their best chance with a country called Prussia. Prussia is, of course, the largest German territory at that time. This is a family picture of Victoria and Albert with their children at the time. The most important of these children is the one in the far right hand corner, the eldest looking, the daughter. This is Princess Victoria who would eventually become the mother of Kaiser Wilhelm II. The paternal grandparents of Kaiser Wilhelm II came from the House of Hohenzollern. First, you have Prince Wilhelm of Prussia, the heir to the Prussian throne, and his wife, Augusta of Saxe, Weimar, Eisenach, Princess of Prussia. Prussia was ruled by Frederick Wilhelm IV, the brother of Wilhelm. He would live from 1795 to 1861. Frederick Wilhelm IV had been on the throne since 1840, and he had faced a major revolution in the year of 1848. It was during this revolution that he granted Prussia a constitution. Prussia was considered the most liberal of all the German states that Prince Albert had observed although it was still, comparative to the British monarchy, very conservative. But Frederick Wilhelm was a reformer. Unfortunately, by 1858, Frederick Wilhelm IV began suffering from mental issues, and his more conservative brother, Wilhelm, would begin acting on his behalf as regent. Wilhelm's wife, Augusta, was regarded by many Germans as, quote, cold, conventional, scheming, uptight, and intellectually arrogant. This was probably because they did not like the liberal streak that ran through her because she was raised in Weimar and shared some, if not all, of the same liberal ideas that Albert had. Albert, knowing that Wilhelm being converted was not an option, and that Frederick Wilhelm IV was not long for the throne, he decided to look at another way of bringing Prussia into the liberal fold, this time using Augusta as his key to secure a continental alliance with Prussia. Princess Augusta was also on board with this as she wished to cultivate a relationship with Queen Victoria, hoping that they could convert her son, Frederick, to liberalism and nationalism through marriage to their daughter, Victoria the Princess Royale. And that is exactly what will happen. 
the union between Britain and Prussia will be sealed with the marriage of Victoria and Frederick on January 25th, 1858. Within a matter of months, Princess Victoria was with child. This child became the synthesis of this union. The irony of history is that this child was looked upon to be a future reformer, a sign of peace and prosperity between the British and Prussian, later German peoples. Yet within 56 years, these two great powers went to war and the absolutist regime of the German Reich was destroyed forever. Labor began for Princess Victoria shortly after midnight on January 26, 1859. The young mother would suffer considerably during the long and torturous delivery that would last throughout the following day. The pain was so excruciating that chloroform was used for several hours and the life of the mother and the baby hung in the balance because of the strange prenatal position of the child. The baby, when finally born, was officially named Frederick Wilhelm Victor Albrecht, all traditional names of the Hohenzollern and Hanoverian dynasties, reminding everyone of his dual heritage. Now many people wonder why this future emperor never shows the left hand side of his body, specifically his hand and his arm. Well, it was not until three days after the delivery that anyone noticed that the baby's left arm was deformed. It had been assumed that the dislocation of the elbow joint and the shoulder socket were damaged during delivery, but it was believed by physicians that these injuries might be corrected with orthopedic treatments. Many scholars continue to debate the cause of his injuries. One story stated that while Victoria was five months pregnant, she tripped over a chair leg in the palace and fell violently while others suggest that they were caused by the mother's physical condition from the strain of the pushing of her mother's liberal agenda. The injuries, though, were proven to be more damaging than originally believed. Along with the left arm, his neck was damaged, which led to partial deafness in one ear. The neck tendons were tight and made it difficult for the child to hold his head upright. Shortly after his birth, the young prince underwent two painful surgeries that cut the tendons in his neck, but that did successfully allow him to straighten his head. By five months old, Wilhelm could raise his left arm and there was slight movement in his fingers, but his elbow would not bend and his hand was useless to perform any task. When he was six months old, it was decided to try and heal the arm. The arm, every effort was made to do so. His right hand was strapped to his body so that he was forced to use the useless left arm. At seven months, he was treated to having his arm wrapped in the entrails of freshly killed rabbits in order to stimulate circulation through heat. The doctors even tried electroshock therapy with little results except excruciating pain for the patients. From the earliest moments of his life, Victoria was horrified at the thought of having a disabled child. Being a self-centered parent, Victoria could not accept her defective son and felt that he, her own perfection was marred by his deformity. While she always blamed herself for this, she also believed that her husband's blood was to blame. She believed that her husband was from a less illustrious family than her own, and in these early formative months, feelings of racial inferiority superseded maternal instinct. Instead of loving compassion for her child, an underlying grudge formed that would last until her dying day. Victoria also blamed the German doctors who delivered her little prince and would from that moment on only use English physicians. However, the major strike against her young son would involve her father's political ambitions for Prussia. Prince Albert saw his daughter as his assistant in his quest to bring a new golden era to the world. They wished to see Prussia adopt an English-style government with universal suffrage, a representative parliament, and a cabinet with the monarch acting as a benign figurehead who would act as a consultant but not an autocrat. 
as the future Queen of Prussia, Victoria was to be the mentor and guide for her husband. As a mother, she would raise the heir to the throne as a liberal, progressive English gentleman modeled after her father. When his grandfather died in December of 1861, Victoria suffered a blow that she would never recover from. She became obsessed with recreating her father and her young son, and she made it her mission that his ideas and hopes would never be forgotten. This led to Wilhelm having a heavy burden lifted on his tiny shoulders, as he was now the vessel in which his mother would fulfill her fantasy. Also, as he grew older, his disability became more noticeable to those around him. It affected his facial expression, his stance, and made his stride clumsy and awkward. By 1865, Prince Wilhelm had become aware of his disability, and to combat it, he cleverly leaned to support his left arm on his belt or in his pocket to let the rein slip into his left hand from his normal right one, making him able to ride a horse without the help of a groom. This compensation led to his right hand becoming overdeveloped, highly muscular, which led to balance problems continuing throughout his life. Wilhelm's father, Prince Frederick Wilhelm, after 1861 the Crown Prince, was absent for most of his early life while fighting in the Danish War of 1864 and the Austrian War of 1866. During these wars, he won a reputation as the most successful general in the Hohenzollern dynasty for four decades. And without his arrival at Konitzgrat in July of 1866, the battle would have been lost and a defeat for Prussia. The lack of materials in the journals of both men would lead many to believe that there was little emotional contact between father and son, especially during these early years, but from all accounts, there seems to be a rather affectionate relationship between the two. When he was at home, Prince Frederick Wilhelm took Wilhelm on walks to sightseeing in Brandenburg and on picnics in the woods and lakes near Potsdam. They also visited medieval castles and looked at pictures in military books. Unlike his wife, who concentrated on his disability, Frederick took pride in his young son. Wilhelm responded to his father's kindness and calmer disposition, which may have enabled him to control his hyperactive son. While Victoria hoped to turn her child into a carbon copy of Prince Albert, Frederick hoped his son would become a balanced, rational, and kind young man. Frederick believed that his son should follow his grandfather, father, and himself in governing the fatherland in a noble and fair manner. He also wished to see his son raised as a German, not as an Englishman, and this led to tension between himself and his wife, who wished the opposite. This is why the early relationship between the young prince and his parents was always a time of confusion for the small boy. While most small boys look to their fathers as an example of manhood and their mothers as nurturers and protectors, in the household of Frederick and Victoria, these roles were reversed. When growing up in England, Victoria had grown accustomed to hearing her mother speak and her father obey. As a wife and a mother, she ran the household as she observed while growing up. She was not the type of mother who inspired independence in her offspring, she grew upset as they matured and wanted to branch out. Frederick admitted his shortcomings and observed his wife's superior qualities and became increasingly dependent on her. During these childhood years, Wilhelm wished to see the roles reversed, to have a strong and domineering father and a tender and compassionate mother. To Wilhelm, his father's dependence on Victoria was a sign of weakness, and during his childhood years he sought to force them into their traditional roles. Although the situation was lukewarm as he approached his 10th year, the relationship would begin to change for the worse. On January 27, 1869, Wilhelm turned 10 years old. By tradition of the House of Hohenzollern, he joined the army. Wilhelm I was pleased by how well his grandson carried out his military duties, especially in spite of his disabilities. Wilhelm I followed his grandson's military career with unceasing care and kindness. 
it was from his grandfather and not his parents that Wilhelm received support, confidence, and responsibility over the next 19 years. Prince Wilhelm saw his grandfather as having a godlike aura, and he loved and respected the old man. Looking back on his sheltered childhood, Wilhelm once said that he looked up to his grandfather, Wilhelm I, and his chancellor, Otto von Bismarck. These were figures that were alive and active in the real world, not shut away in a fantasy land of morality like his parents. With the outbreak of the war with France in 1870, Wilhelm's life would change forever. Frederick was given command of the Southern Army, while his father would lead the combined forces of the Prussians and the Northern German states. As his father left, Wilhelm was proud and confident that his father would return victorious. During the war, though, the young prince was not allowed to be ignorant to the horrors of war. His mother established a hospital in Hamburg, where she encouraged her sons to visit the wounded, mutilated, and dying French soldiers. By the time the successes from the front were reported in late 1870, many in the German states were looking towards Prussia to unify Germany. As early as December 1870, liberals and Romantics wished to see a united Germany under him as a hereditary king. All the kings and princes would be given the title of Duke. Unfortunately, this was a Romantic gesture that neither Friedrich nor his contemporary and fellow Romantic Bavarian King Ludwig II rejected. The conservatives favored a federal system where each kingdom would retain its identity and rulers but would be identified and unified under the Prussian king, who would act as the president of the Union as a symbolic emperor. Wilhelm I was skeptical of the imperial dignity, as was his brother Frederick Wilhelm IV when it was offered to him. But he accepted because it was given to him by the will of the hereditary German rulers but not because it was given to him by the Reichstag and, most importantly, the middle class. On January 17, 1871, the German Reich was proclaimed in the Hall of Mirrors at the Palace of Versailles. From this point on, Wilhelm realized that one day he would not only succeed his father on the throne as King of Prussia, but now also as the German Emperor or Kaiser. When his grandfather and father arrived home from Paris in June of 1871, a victory parade was held through Berlin, now the capital of the German Empire. Wilhelm was present to watch his grandfather and father enter the capital at the head of their armies. It was during these events that his grandfather put his hand on the young prince's shoulder and showing the magnitude of the day's events said, quote, This is a day you will never forget. While Wilhelm II, for his part, tried to avoid taking sides in parental disagreements, his neutrality only worsened relations. Victoria believed that when he sided against her that he allied himself with Bismarck and the Prussian elite. Frederick became mistrustful and jealous of his son, and an estrangement began between them. Beginning at this time, Frederick, who was seen as too liberal by his father, was sidelined from many events, he was allowed to do things such as the picture here, going to weddings, uh, other non-political functions of the realm, but he was replaced by his son, Wilhelm, when it came to political affairs. In 1884, Wilhelm was sent to St. Petersburg over his father to celebrate the 16th birthday of the Tsarevich, the future Nicholas II. This was seen as a great dishonor to his father. His father was very jealous as he believed as crown prince he should represent the Reich on all foreign trips. But Wilhelm also did this to show the emperors of Austria, Germany, and Russia that they would stand firm against liberal democracies which Frederick and his wife were advocating in Germany. He also wished that Nicholas and Wilhelm would become acquainted 
as one day they would be contemporaries and sovereign rulers of two allied nations. Frederick would have his revenge later that year, though, during army maneuvers. He acted as if his son was not there, while his son Heydrich was noticed and honored by being on his father's staff. Wilhelm did not allow anyone to see how disappointed he was to feel ignored and neglected by his father. This is in stark contrast with the pride that his grandfather felt in his young grandson during those same maneuvers. It was this pride in his grandson that allowed Wilhelm to attend state functions, again further arousing his father's jealous streak. But not everything would be going the way of Friedrich, because in January of 1877 he became ill with what at the time they believed was inflammation of the larynx. At first it was thought that this condition was due to a cold, but by May 15th they realized it must be something worse. His German doctors, Dr. Wagner and Dr. Gerhardt, believed the tumor to be that of cancer of the larynx. They consulted a Dr. Bergman, who recommended the immediate removal of the infected vocal membranes. Being assured that hoarseness would be the only side effect, Friedrich agreed to the operation. His wife, fearing the ability of the German doctors after the botched birth of Wilhelm in 1859, sent for a laryngitis laryngologist from England. Dr. Mackenzie arrived on the eve of the operation and after his examination declared the operation canceled as Frederick did not suffer from cancer. He also claimed that even with the surgery, 27% of patients died during the operation while 55% died within two years. This contradicted everything the German physicians said. Their opinion was that 75% recovery rate from the surgery. Wilhelm saw this illness as a chance for him to win his father from his mother and her liberal ideas. While watching his mother interfere negligently in his father's care, Wilhelm remembered his own medical torture in the early life and he was further poisoned to his mother. Wilhelm complained about the hiring of an English doctor who declared there to be no cancer while all the German specialists believed otherwise. With Frederick being ill, Wilhelm appointed his grandson to attend Queen Victoria's Jubilee in May of 1887. The following year, Frederick became sicker, and on November 17, 1887, Wilhelm I signed a proclamation appointing his grandson, Prince Wilhelm, as his deputy, in order to allow his son to use this time to recover. Done for his own health, Frederick and Victoria were furious at what they saw as a way to pass him over in the succession. Frederick was also upset that he was not informed of the proclamation beforehand. In reality, Bismarck and Wilhelm I had informed Frederick prior, but Victoria feared the effects on her husband's health and withheld the letter. However upset they may have been, Frederick was forced to watch helplessly as his son now signed government papers and began to rule the Reich instead of him. This episode will complete the rift between Wilhelm and his parents, and his mother will look upon him with indifference while his father felt jealousy and contempt. The beginning of the year, 1888, would open on a series of highs and lows for the Hohenzollern family. In early January, Frederick's condition worsened as he developed a constant temperature and his throat filled with pus. Wilhelm had so angered over the deputy issue that Victoria refused to toast to her son's birthday, putting her disappointment and anger towards her son before her husband's declining health. By February, it was decided that because of breathing problems, he must undergo surgery to remove the tumor and allow for a feeding through a tube. It was during this operation that the German doctors finally convinced everyone involved that the disease was cancer, although Dr. McKenzie still denied it and refused to observe it under a microscope. As pitiful as his situation had become, news that his father was gravely ill gave him hope that he might finally succeed to the imperial throne. On March 2nd, Prince Wilhelm was recalled to Berlin from his father's recovery at San Remo because of the news that his grandfather was dying. 
When he arrived on March 7th, Wilhelm received the news that Wilhelm I had only a few hours to live. On March 8th, he arrived at his bedside to a, to a barely conscious grandfather as he began to speak to those in attendance. When Bismarck came to see his dying master for the last time, Wilhelm I mistook him for his grandson and reiterated his satisfaction and pride in him, something for which he was grateful as he never received that type of encouragement from his parents. Wilhelm then came up to see his grandfather, and he was mistaken for his father. While talking to Wilhelm, he reiterated his desire to see the continuation of alliance with Russia and to use him as a role model for how Germany should be governed. The Russian alliance was particularly stressed because Wilhelm I felt that the Hohenzollern and Romanov autocracies were linked in destiny, and if one should fall, the other would fall as well. Wilhelm I died on the morning of March 9, 1888. Thus came to an end the adored symbol of a united Germany in the person of what Wilhelm would eventually call, quote, the old man with white whiskers and ruddy complexion. And with him died the most successful era in modern German history. Prince Frederick Wilhelm now became King of Prussia and German Kaiser. His reign, unfortunately, was to be neither happy nor long. On the morning of March 8th, Wilhelm received a letter from his father, the new Kaiser, which stated his distress and jealousy for not being present at his father's deathbed and also reaffirming his son's obedience and loyalty to the crown. There were some who worried that Wilhelm had come to a secret agreement with his dying grandfather and that there would be a coup d'etat to pass over Frederick in the line of succession. The fact that Bismarck had been present as well led Frederick and Victoria to be cautious as the three of them, Wilhelm I, Bismarck, and Wilhelm, had been hostile to their liberal agenda. Frederick and his wife were disturbed because they felt that their son did not want them to reign and that during the reign of Frederick III, quote, all eyes were concentrated on him. Frederick immediately left for Berlin, and Bismarck was instructed to make everything ready for his arrival and enthronement. Recalling his love of romanticism, Frederick wished to be known as Frederick IV. Bismarck opposed this as the German princes would expect him to follow the Prussian traditions, as, quote, the kings of Prussia was also the German emperor. In reality, as the second emperor of the German Reich, Frederick was neither Frederick IV nor Frederick III, but rather Frederick I. But Bismarck gets his way, and the new emperor will be styled Frederick III. Upon his ascension, Frederick III will appoint Dr. Mackenzie as the royal physician, thus angering the conservatives who disliked him and blamed him for the failing health of their new Kaiser. Over the next few months, the 99-day reign of Frederick III, few things of importance will happen in the relationship because Frederick III was isolated from his son. One visit was mandatory, that of his grandmother, Queen Victoria. She arrived in Potsdam on April 24, 1888, to see her beloved Frederick for what was to be the final time. Victoria and her daughter fell into each other's arms, and Wilhelm was called to pay a visit. If not for the British Queen's authority, the dying Frederick may never have been seen his entire family together ever again. However, after her departure, the poison between mother and son came back, and she forbade her son to visit his father again. The night before his death, Frederick III gave audience to his aged chancellor for the final time. Worried about the future of his beloved consort, Frederick III concluded she had better chance of receiving sympathy and consideration from Bismarck than from her own son. Therefore, in a final show of disappointment in his son, Frederick III entrusted his father's faithful servant with the care of his wife, thus making Bismarck the last person the dying emperor would give his confidence. Bismarck had no intention of keeping his word, and the ill treatment of Victoria would endure after his death was attributed mostly to Bismarck and not Wilhelm. When she realized that her husband had little time to live, Victoria reluctantly allowed her son to see his father. 
Wilhelm found his father to be totally exhausted and violently coughing. The entire family surrounded the bedside, and for a brief few hours, they were a family once again. Shortly after 11 in the morning of June 15th, Frederick III ceased to exist. Wilhelm, now Kaiser Wilhelm II, immediately sealed the palace. No one was allowed to enter or leave. He then ransacked his father's office, looking for all state papers that his mother could try to ship to England. While ransacking his father's things, his eyes lit up when he read the faded telegram sent from his grandmother on January 27, 1859. As he read it in his left hand tightly closed around the hilt of his sword, scholars speculated he possibly wondered since he was not the fine boy but rather a crippled child that his parents hated him. Although measures taken after his father's death were severe, Bismarck warned the young emperor that it was imperative so that his mother would be unable to send documents to, to England that could discredit him and the Hohenzollern dynasty. At the request of the German doctors, the new emperor permitted an autopsy on his father. Wilhelm II did this to not only prove that the cancer may not have been fatal had the German doctors been allowed to proceed with their operation in 1887, but also to show that the English doctors and his mother had given harmful advice to their patient. This was not only a personal attack on his mother, but also an insult on her native land of England, for which Wilhelm now held feelings of contempt and confusion. The autopsy proved what Wilhelm II had hoped for, that the cancellation of the surgery at Mackenzie's insistence caused his father's death within a year, and that a timely operation may have successfully prolonged the life of Frederick III by several years, if not several decades. Queen Victoria saw the untimely death of Frederick III as an excuse. Both Wilhelm II and her daughter Victoria needed to continue their estrangement. She urged her grandson to provide for his mother, as his father's last testament stated, but knew that her daughter would not make this task easy. As anyone can tell, Wilhelm II did his best to meet his mother's wishes and, quote, conducted himself with great consideration and was very pleasant. She was allowed to continue to use the title Kaiser and Frederick and to collect the inheritance Frederick III allowed her. On June 18, 1888, Wilhelm II buried his father in a ceremony devoid of foreign envoys and dignitaries. That same day, he ordered the Frederick's Krone Palace to be renamed Nol Palais. This was done to symbolically erase the old reign and to recognize the new emperor, Wilhelm II. Since his birth, Wilhelm had been in the shadow of his English mother. Now a sovereign ruler of Germany, he finally emerged. Victoria remained in Germany, clad in her widow weeds, and she often pondered the state of her adopted country, which her son sat in place of her dear, beloved husband that great man, his father. From 1888 until her death in 1901, she lived in rather obscurity outside Hamburg, being ignored by her eldest son. When she died, her final request was that her body be wrapped in the Union Jack and returned to England for burial. In a final act of hostility towards his mother, Wilhelm buried his mother in Friedrich's church beside his father as a German empress. When looking at the relationship of Wilhelm II, many see the hostility to his mother as the most significant. Throughout his life, he attempted to imitate his father, but he was fundamentally similar to his mother, who he tried to distance himself from. From his mother, Wilhelm inherited a passion for being outdoors, cleanliness on the border of obsessive, and a habit of early rising. Victoria enjoyed singing and painting, while her son loved sketching warships and fleets. He considered himself an amateur composer. He had a remarkable memory and great oratory skills. When he wrote, he mastered the gift of exaggeration and superlatives, both attributed to his mother. His association with the German Navy is an example of his mother's influence. While the Hohenzollern family tradition was the Prussian army, Wilhelm II affiliated himself with the Navy, the traditional armed force of his mother's native land. With two people so similar in character, temperament, and interest, 
it is inevitable that these two intelligent, headstrong people should clash. Victoria loved her children, but was most fond of them when they needed her during childhood. The problems began between mother and son with his disability and later with his independence. As he grew older, he seemed far too independent for his mother's taste, and she began to try to regain control of him. When he realized this, he rebelled against his mother further. She became embittered, and it continued on and on. She always strived to make him the next Prince Albert, and this rebellion made it impossible for her to complete her mission. He saw his rebellion differently, as a way of trying to make his mother proud of him. In his mind, his rebellion was a way of asserting that he was not dependent and weak. Through his rebellion and siding with powerful politicians, he hoped to show his mother that her disappointment in him was unjust, that he was fit to be king. In reality, although she hated his newfound independence, it was her insistence in his normalcy that perpetuated his rebellion. She made him self-reliant, over-reliant, so that he could feed and dress himself despite his disability. This allowed the development of a boy who was far too independent and disobedient for his mother's liking. However, he always would retain the feeling that something was wrong with him due to his mother's hostility and disappointment. The result was that he would never develop the self-esteem, ambition, or confidence, and would rely on others to reassure him of this throughout his life. To his son, Frederick was a perpetual mystery. He saw his father as an ordinary man who was hesitant and weary. Frederick was perceived as being dominated by his wife, although many speculate he may have just been trying to keep the peace within his family. For the average German citizen, it looked as though Victoria turned a simple-minded, gallant, and honorable prince into a weak-minded man devoid of self-reliance. More importantly, the populace believed she was slowly making him more English than Prussian. With all these feelings, Wilhelm sought to understand, identify, and ideologue his father. Like his father, he was attracted to romantic literature and loved wearing military uniforms. While his mother believed his love of Prussian military traditions were the influence of Bismarck and Wilhelm I, it may have been in association with his father during the peak of his own military career. Frederick was far from being the perfect parent. He was away on campaigns or government business for much of Wilhelm's early years, sometimes absent for a year at a time. Wilhelm in his own writing seemed to feel neglected by his absent father, although a lifelong longing for his father, who at times he barely knew. His preference for male companionship was seen by some as suppressed homosexuality. However, it may be this longing for a father that led him to find people who he could replace his psychologically absent dad. The result was to haunt Wilhelm II throughout the rest of his life. With his horrific childhood, Wilhelm attempted to recreate the activities his mother would not allow. He enjoyed playing games that appeared to be distasteful, such as throwing cake in guests' mouths during banquets. He enjoyed dressing as a sailor or soldier, fantasizing about being a great admiral or general in an epic battle. During World War I, he spent hours crayoning in all the forest on the war maps to make them more accurate. And in exile, after the war, he served his guest Moselle while he drank a lesser glass of Burgundy. When asked why, he repeated that it was because, quote, he was not allowed to have it in his youth. During his lifetime, Wilhelm, like his mother, became self-centered and took things personally. For example, his sister married the heir to the Greek throne. It was customary for her to convert to the Greek Orthodox Church. Wilhelm took his sister's abandonment of his religion as a personal insult and banished her from the Reich. In an attempt to show his superiority to the other monarchs, despite his disability, he delighted in pointing out physical abnormalities in others. He referred to the king of Italy, Victor Emmanuel, as a dwarf, while insulting the large-nosed king of Bulgaria, Ferdinand, by calling him Ferdinando Naze. In reality, this man of confusion and confliction was a creation of his parents, a mother whose dream was to turn her half-Prussian child into an English gentleman like her father, forgetting that her father was a German Anglophile, 
with little or no English blood in his veins. His father was an emotional stranger who allowed his mother to abuse him as an infant and squash his growing independence in adolescence. The irony is that while he looked on his mother as an English woman who was hostile to the fatherland, the main inheritance he got from his mother was his inflexible will for which his devotion to the fatherland is attributed. Thank you for watching and listening. If you have any comments or questions, please post them in the discussion forum for the 8-1 presentation Q&A for week 8. Thank you.